Close your eyes. Imagine that instead of coming here this evening, you've gone to Harbour Summit on a date. You're in a bar and the music is smooth jazz. There's some soft candlelight. You're excited. You haven't met this person before, but you have stalked them on social media and you think they're quite cool. So you need to make a good impression. The door opens. A bit of wind blows in, a bit of autumn leaves. This person walks in. Wow. Pretty cool. And they've got that casual confidence. And you just know you need, you need to be impressive. Play it cool. Deep breath. You walk up and you say, Can I kiss you? Date gone. You've, looked, you've missed your chance, you blew it. Why? You can open your eyes first. Um, because, because you came on too strong. Yeah? You came on too strong. And that leads me to my first observation of the evening. Composers need better pickup lines. Okay? Because what we do when we find an opportunity that we want to make music for, we say, I'm a composer, can I write music for you? We come on too strong. Whereas what we should actually be doing is a bit like in that date situation, we should be, we should be getting to know this person. You know, we should work out why is it that we want to write music for them? Why would they want us to write music for them? You know? Would this be a good relationship? You know, a good professional relationship. We need to think about those things. We need to build up before we say, can I write music for you? Yeah? And the other problem is, I'm a composer, right? We're all composers in this room, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be here, all right? Hello, thank you. Um, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So if we all say, I'm a composer, no shit, yeah? Okay? Um, so there are two things, two models I'd like to show you, first of all, that can help us get better pickup lines, okay? And this is the self-publishing angle of this talk. The first is Ikigai. Has anybody come across this? No. It's a Japanese concept that's supposed to help you live long and prosper, as Scott would say. And yeah, quite existential, I know. We're going to apply it to composition, okay? So Ikigai is about how you can kind of live your most happiest, most successful life, but kind of bearing all these things in mind. And the way to do that is to get all these things correct. Okay, what you love, what you're good at, what you can pay for, what God needs. If you can find something in you that is in the middle of all of those things, you can succeed and you can be happy. So as a composer, what do you love? Yeah? You like film music. Say you're a film music composer. You like writing film music. Nah, not good enough. Okay? There are plenty of people who could do that, who could say that. Yeah? What film music do you love? Do you, is there a particular composer you like? Is there a particular genre you like writing in? Um, is there a particular film you like watching or that inspires you? Yeah, what do you really, really love about that thing? What are you good at? Maybe you're good at orchestrating. That's a cool skill. Maybe you're good at singing and what your kind of unique selling point is is that you'll sing and you'll kind of record yourself singing and composing at the same time. Maybe you can improvise. Yeah, maybe that's what we're good at. What you can be paid for. And this is hard skills and other things too. Yeah, you can be paid for sound design in, in like uh, composition. You can be paid for sound effects, you can be paid for foley, you can be paid for composition, you can be paid for orchestration. But you can also be paid for soft skills. And this is a little source uh, from the BFI Skills Audit of UK Film and Scene Industries. Yes, it's a film source, it applies to us too, it applies to creative industries. Um, Creative people, surprisingly, are lacking in social skills, in soft skills. So how can you show that you have these things? Yeah? And chances are, if you've got up to someone and you said, I'm a composer, I can write music for you, you've already exposed that you're lacking in those qualities. And finally, what the world needs. The world doesn't need more composers. Okay? Um, what the world does need is more composers who can write in niches. Like, maybe you're a composer who can write jazz really well, and again, you can sing 
as, as you're writing or you can improvise. Maybe you're a composer who's specifically good at some kind of theatre piece or some sort of opera piece, you know, where there's like a live component, there's a bit of serendipity in that. That's what the world needs. So if you can find something in the middle of all that that can really play to your strengths, you're away. Um, I picked this example up from Bristol Independent Films Festival on the weekend. And yes, it is a director, but that's by the by. Here's an example, okay? You're reading this program, you come across this one, Alan Gupta. He doesn't say, I'm a director. He says, diverse, inclusive, and loves blending fiction with contemporary social issues so that his films can reach a wider audience. Okay? Instantly we know what he does, the kind of films he makes, and why he does that. Okay? So be thinking about why you write music and the, the, well, the kind of music you make and why you write music. And to help you think about that, I wanted to show you another model. It's on, well, it's kind of the other hand now. Um, it's Sarasvati, 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 Sarasvati um, affects logic. Try saying that three times. Um, but it's about thinking about what you've got rather than what you lack, okay? What's your needs? So who do you know? What do you have? What can you do? What do you know? Yeah? Your goals. And not long term, but short term. What are the small things you can do that will make a big impact? And that's the affordable loss bit, yeah? I'm sure we'd all love our own studio, but we're not probably, most of us aren't in the financial position to be able to buy, make, build, whatever, our own studio. So what can we do instead? Maybe there's a small virtual soundtrack instrument plugin that we could buy, yeah? Maybe there's a ticket to a film festival we could go to just to meet some people, yeah? Those are all small costs that could have a really, really big impact. Interactions and commitments. This idea of networking horizontally was one I came across recently. We're very good at thinking, oh wow, that's, that's a producer, you know, that's a composer, I'd love to talk to them. But they've already got their own network. Chances are we've not got a way in that. The way in is these people in this room right now. Because we're all probably looking to do this in some way or another, whether it's professionally or just kind of as a hobby. We all have our own strengths. We all have something we could kind of bring to the table. So if we network in this room and with people at this university, that's really cool. Because say, again, I'll use the example of film music, Say you talk to film students, chances are they're going to want to go far in film, okay? So if you talk to them now, before they've gone so far that you're kind of not at their level, you can make a really big difference. And that's where you, you get new leads, you meet new people, you get new goals, you can extend that, okay, what can I do to keep making an impact? And you can make new things. And I combined both these models because it was fun. Um, and that's on your handout if you want it. I think. Art for me, anyway, I think that's the art of the life, the universe, and everything. Um, but be thinking about that, about how you can build in what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what is needed to make something that differentiates you from everybody else. So you don't just go, I'm a composer, I can write music for you. You go, you talk about what you love, you talk about what you can do that's different, and that way you'll remember it. Let's talk about Oreos. You've all got an Oreo, and well, I, well, there are clearly some empty seats, so you're welcome to take other people's Oreos as well. <laughs> um, and there's so much that goes into an Oreo, you know? Uh, there's a lot of miles that it travels to get here. It, that someone had to build a factory to make this Oreo, someone had to build a mould to make the little Oreo bit. Yeah? I had to go to Sainsbury's to buy them. Okay, a lot of time and effort goes into something which you could eat in about 10 seconds, yeah? But what is the Oreo? Is it the biscuit that you've got in front of you, or is it the piece of paper that you've also got in front of you which has the recipe for making Oreos? Yeah? You can't eat the recipe, but you can't make and eat the biscuit without the recipe. So both have equal value. The same can be said for music. Music is an oral product which we consume, but we can't consume that product if there wasn't some sort of score or arrangement or something 
that allowed for that product to be recorded and made so that we could consume it. But equally, we can't just see a score and hear it. You know, we can maybe hear it a little bit in our head, but we can't physically hear a score. So both the score and the recorded element are equally important and valuable. And that brings me on to my second observation of the evening, that composers need to protect their recipes as well as their biscuits. And there are two organisations that can help you do this. PRS and PPL. Or I should say PRS for Music. PRS for Music uh, is about publishing rights. It protects your recipe. It protects your score. Phonographic Performance Lid is about recordings and master rights. It protects your biscuit. It protects that end product. And both are equally important if you're kind of producing your own music and you're putting it out there. Let's just break these down a bit more. PRS for Music is actually two organisations, confusingly enough. It's PRS and MCPS. The difference between PRS and MCPS is PRS is about live performance, and if your music is played live, performed live. MCPS is about if it's produced mechanically. Um, so that would be in like an online recording in film or uh, in TV or something like that. And Photographic Performance Lid is about collecting royalties for the people that kind of were involved in making the recording. So say you get a band together to record your music, um, you need to make sure those people get you know, treated fairly with respect uh, of the recording that you've done. And there, there are a lot of questions about you know, which one should I join. Ideally, you join all of those. Okay? If you're looking to take this professionally, you definitely should be thinking about that. Okay? Um, specifically film composers, you probably want to join both. If you're just join, if you're just kind of composing music for sort of live performances at the moment, you need only join one. Um, but certainly if you're putting your music out online, which I think given today's climate, most of us are doing that, you probably want to join both. Unfortunately, it does come at a cost. Everything does. Um, one off hundred pound fee for both of them. That does feel like a lot, but then when you think you've got it your whole life, pretty reasonable, okay? Um, and it's and it's a kind of a professional thing to do to sort of take you to that next level. If we're talking about that affordable loss bit, it's it's a worthwhile investment, really, to be able to protect your music, to be able to do things, to be able to do things right. And there's quite a cumbersome sign-up process, and I, I will say that both the software for PRS for Music and PPL are both quite cumbersome, unfortunately, um, but it, it, it's very intuitive in talking you through it. It does advise you with some little sliders. It says, you know, if you haven't had your music played this much, or say you've only had your music played three times live, or maybe you've had it played lots in small cafes and venues, or you've had it played a couple of times in a big concert venue, um, it'll kind of tell you, yeah, this is probably the right time for you to start setting up this thing. But bottom line, if you are looking to take this professionally, you probably want to sign up anyway. And the other thing to note when you're using PRS is it will ask you, do you want a USA uh, performing rights organisation to cover licences in the USA? Probably you do, yeah? And there are three you can choose from, ASCAP, BMI and CSAC. CSAC's by invitation only, so that's probably not going to be you. Um, the differences between ASCAP and BMI are extremely negligible. Uh, I recommend BMI just simply from the... <laughs> uh, it's really hard to tell the difference, but from the, the narrow differences I've managed to tell, you get faster payouts of royalties with BMI, and they seem to be kind of better at helping your music get out there. In theory, I can't tell you that in practice. PPL then, Phonographic Performance Lid. So the recordings now, not the recipe, the biscuit. Um, that's free, thank goodness. Okay, and it, that includes music videos as well. VPL is the sister company that includes music videos and you sign up to both in the same process. Uh, you just need to have one piece of music, one, one sound recording I should say, um, out online to be able to you know, sign up. We all, you know, that's relatively easy to, to justify. Um, what these websites produce, amazingly, uh, is a load of numbers and a load of identifiers for the recording, and it is 
jargon and it is hard to keep track of, but hopefully this sort of breaks down what's important, okay? The important ones are the tune code, which is what PRS give you when you've registered a recording, and that's just kind of like an important, unique identifier for that piece of music, that recipe uh, that you've recorded. The International Standard uh, Worldwide Code is, the, is like tune code, but worldwide. Um, PPL, Producer Recording ID, again, similar to the tune code, but specifically for that recording. And then you get a UPC, which the distributor gives you. Um, but the more interesting and, and more relevant one for you guys to note is the International Standard Recording Code. And that is, when you sign up to PPL, they give you a first registrant code in the company code. They give you the first five characters of that string of characters, essentially. And what this code is, it's for literally every recording you produce, you can give it one of these, okay? Whether you, and you don't have to kind of type it into something to do that. You can literally just say, this is my recording, okay, this is the ID of that recording. And it can help you kind of find it later. It can help you catalogue your own music in, I don't know, an Excel document or whatever you do. I'll give you an example. I'm GX3R3, okay? Uh, so, if you're UK based, the first two characters will be UK, GB or GX and the second three characters will be your unique identifier as a composer or a writer. Um, so if I'm GX3R3 in the first recording I do in 2023, I register or I don't even register, I just write it down. My the code for that recording will be GX3R3 230001. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. We're getting into agreements now with contracts, and this is where it, that, yeah, the nitty gritty comes in, okay? There are, well, as, as you'll see in a minute, there are a couple of websites you can use to generate templates for contracts. But the key things that your contracts need to have and you need to be aware of are as follows. Firstly, you need to be able to have kind of a deadline on that contract. You need to be very clear when it's, the score is expected. And you can write in, well, there are ways, you know, there are ways to say to the producer, hey, I need a bit more time, that's fine. And you can, you can write that into the contract to say, look, more time is, if more time is needed, talk to the producer and, and things like that. But it's good to have a deadline to work to it. Fixed compensation. So that's how much you are being paid, which is very important, you know, um, hopefully if you're being paid. And the key thing to do with this is to have it in two installments. Because sometimes, especially with independent projects, they fall through. And that means if you've spent, I don't know, about five hours or something on something already, or maybe even ten, maybe even more, and then the project falls through, and they can't, they kind of, they've lost some money or whatever, you will still have got a bit of money for the work that you've done. And that is important because, you know, we, we can't all work for free, yeah? Um, so if you're doing two, two installments, that, that's kind of a good way of structuring as well. It shows you're kind of serious about what you do. Expenses. You need to check if, that, if expenses are included in that fixed compensation. And indeed, if you're writing the contract, you can either set, specify whether they are or whether they're not. So if, say, you're writing music and you're recording it using virtual soundtrack instruments, you know, not a live band, um, you can do a lot more with a thousand pounds, yeah? But if you're writing music and then you've got to hire a band and record with that band, suddenly that's quite tight, okay? Because you probably want to pay the musician as well. You'd want to, might have to rent a recording space, you might have to print the music, yeah? Um, so it needs to be clarified whether that fixed compensation you're getting includes expenses. Credits, obvious one, but just to say, yeah, make sure you're getting proper credit for your work. If you've got a sort of pseudonym or whatever that you use, you know, you can specify, I want to be, it's say, music by whatever, um, or composed by or whatever, um, and you have full control over that. And finally, ownership and use. It's sort of stipulated that you, and usually, that you're an independent contractor working for hire, okay? And the main thing to note with this is that if they want some copyright of the music, 
then you should be charging more. But most cases in independent projects, certainly, they'll want to pay as little as possible. Okay? And that means you keep the rights. And you should always try to keep the rights to your music, if you possibly can. Okay? Um, I mentioned... Oh, come on to that. Uh, um, the other important thing with contracts is the share split. And when you're putting something into PRS, it asks you this, asks you what's the percentage of perform performance royalties that go to somebody, what's the percentage of mechanical royalties that go to somebody. And this needs to be stipulated in your contract as well. Okay, so if you're a composer, that will kind of come under the writer, publisher share. So if you're, if you're producing your own music, chances are you're, you're your own publisher. Yeah, certainly this is about self-publishing, um, so that can usually go to you as well. But if you're working with a label, perhaps if you're working with a production company, they might want to slice at that time. So you need to make sure that's in your contract and that's discussed to make sure there's kind of no loose ends on that, okay? And again, if, if they want, if the production company or if there's a label or commissioner wants a site of a publisher's share, Chances are they should be paying you more in an upfront fee. But, uh, these are the websites I mentioned, contracts, templates. Musicians Union has stuff for performers as well, very good website. Studio Binders is more for film composers or kind of film, but it's, it's also relevant here. We're now getting to that stage where we've registered our music, you know, we know it can get the rights, it can collect royalties, great. And now we want to distribute. So the first thing you could do is put it up on SoundCloud and websites like SoundCloud, which are sort of relatively casual. Yeah, they're quite good for if you're putting a kind of a small portfolio up of varied things. You know, you don't kind of want to commit to saying this is a single, this is an album, this is an EP. Um, it's more just to show what you can do. SoundCloud is quite a good website for that. You can monetize the music on SoundCloud as well. And it tends to work quite well being embedded into social media or into websites. So you can use SoundCloud for that, I would recommend it. And then DistroKid. If you're wanting to put your music on streaming services, so that you're a bit more committed, maybe you've just done a film soundtrack and you want to put out a film soundtrack album or something, and obviously you've checked with the producer that that's okay. Um, you can use DistroKid to do that, to get onto Spotify, get onto Apple. And that's a sign up for free thing. Um, there are ways to spend money on DistroKid, but I certainly haven't um, done that. You don't have to to be able to get out onto streaming services to get what you need. But then once it's on streaming, you can do other things like use Spotify for artists to track what people are listening to, uh, who's listening, where they're listening. Yeah, and I think Apple have recently done an Apple for artists too. So there are ways to kind of to track that demographically. And then also, when it comes to profile, there's an option on profile, and it means that when someone goes on your Spotify profile, you can have a picture of you, you can have a biography. If you're selling merchandise for your band, you can put that on there. If you're having a concert, you can put that on there. Yeah? And it means you can start selling yourself, you can start incorporating that branding you're initially talking about into that profile as well. So just to sum up from the two lessons of today, uh, you need to brand yourself. The self-publishing thing is key. And yes, you can sign up to as many performing rights organizations as you like, whatever. You won't make any money if nobody's listening to your music. And the way to get people to listen to your music is to have a brand, is to be strong, strongly branded, um, and to tell people and to get the word out there. Because if you're quiet about it, no one will ever know. But then if you do start to do that, you need to be aware that you might want to protect your music, you want to protect your intellectual property uh, of your scores, and the two very much go hand in hand. So there we go. Um, that's me done. Thank you very much. Any questions? Bill. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you introduced your, 
left side of this axe, blow you to side and put this new thing. Yes. Are they kind of, um, they pay the money, they, they, are they like a private company or they have belong to like a music society and they are not, they are not profit? Um, so PRS, take that, that flat fee that you pay, for example, the £100, is, is kind of administra an administrative fee that just covers the whole activity of them collecting royalties for you and, and kind of working with companies. So say you published a score and, I'll, I'll use Bob Music again as an example, uh, a production company wanted to use that music they could either approach you directly or they could go through PRS and then PRS would kind of administrate that deal for you kind of as a go-between and that money that you pay, that £100 for example, just covers activity like that. But as I say, it covers the whole, it's a flat fee, a one-off and you never have to pay that again. Do you do more like keep them that set? Let's for example, somebody carry you to write the music yeah. They sell, they sell you, are you thinking more for that? They, they make them more, feel more trust and in the, in the composer or the, the number of that that we have to be doing this very thing. Um, yeah, so, you, yeah, so ideally obviously you want to be getting to talk to people in person and kind of establishing those personal relations with people. Um, it does, in contracts, if you say you're affiliated with PRS and you say, and kind of you're in good standing with PRS, it does show a certain level of professionalism. Uh, and then if you're taking action to protect your music and, yeah, again, that, that kind of professionalism level, certainly being registered with PRS does help. Any more questions? I'm surprised people have not eaten their warriors, I've got to say. If you need a permission to be go on, yeah. Go on, Josh. Um, I think asking in terms of like every time we release a like form of art, do you need to let the artist know that every time it's performed or that someone is looking at it or whatever it is? The responsibility, really, I would say, lies with the musical director of the ensemble that is getting that piece play because you well I mean in, in an ideal world right you won't always know when your piece is, is being performed or like if, if your piece became well known or whatever and it was spreading around um, people would not everybody who's playing would necessarily be in direct contact with you and it is their responsibility if they're a professional ensemble to to kind of go through this this way and make sure you get you get provided I'd imagine for example in like well, with the Vikrams, if there are pieces that are played by composers who are still alive or still in their music still in copyright, they would make it home to the Vikrams would liaise with these companies, make sure this kind of thing was, 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 was right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks Josh, thank you very much, thank you all very much.